How are you guys? Awesome. So um, I'm here with uh, Jim Brown and Chris Hamill. We're part of the Microsoft Finance team. We support the marketing and consumer business. And what we're going to do today is we're going to show you, so we're all finance people, we're going to show you how we leverage Microsoft tools, everything from analysis services to SharePoint to Power BI, uh, to deliver that end-to-end -end experience for our customers, which are finance folks. And so uh, with that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand it over to Jim. And Jim is going to take us through kind of the data integration layer, how we build our analysis services models. And then in 20 minutes, Chris is going to come up and show you how we leverage SharePoint and Power BI to really deliver that seamless experience. So. All right. Thank you, Lon. So this is just a uh, kind of a, so basically I'll talk in the beginning just about infrastructure and some of the principles that we follow in cube development. Um, when I first started at Microsoft, I'd been there five years, it was more on-premise servers. We've migrated to Azure VMs, and now we are even fur further migrating to Azure Analysis Services, and that's what a lot of this demo is driven off of. Um, as far as um, our design, as far as our design principles, um, we there's three core beliefs that we or core principles that we follow when we do our, our cube development. The first one is accuracy, obviously. I mean, if the data isn't accurate and the users don't trust data, then there's no point in doing that work. Um, there is the reliability aspect of it. So reliability and that when our customers are actually trying to pull data, it actually works. And then also reliability in refreshing of the data. So um, we have between three and four data refreshes a day. So it's imperative that we build out a reliable system um, and really kind of maintenance free. So basically, um, you know, once we have our kind of our solution in place, it's really hands off um, unless there's some kind of new dev work that takes place or new requirement. But really, it's, you know, hands off. Um, and then finally, there's that performance issue. Um, again, it's one of those things where, you know, if the cube, if the, if the user is waiting for your cube to refresh or they do a pivot and they're just watching it spin, then they just get quickly frustrated and then they'll go to a different tool. Um, so if you do the next slide. So this is kind of a, a, a basic structure of what we have in place currently in, in finance. We have two kind of core cubes here. There's our, our P&L cube, which really revolves around um, re revenue and expenses. And then we have a sales cube, which revolves around sales and um, units sold. Um, and we have those kind of built out as final cubes. Um, the P&L cube has about 1.5 billion records. Uh, the sales cube has 1.3 billion records. Uh, okay, and then obviously we have a bunch of other data sources um, that we utilize in some of these purpose-built cubes, and I'll get to that a little bit later. But primarily, we're just focusing uh, on these two. Um, you know, 95% of our customers are focusing on these two cubes. Um, kind of as I mentioned before, so we certainly have um, use cases where the customer wants very specific data, and Chris will cover that in the spend cube, where we pull from a variety of different data sources. So that's where these purpose-built cubes come into place. So they're much smaller in nature. Um, but they target a very specific audience of people. Um, and then finally, I'll talk about, this is a little bit unique to us and something that we've um, discovered over time is having these dimension cubes. So basically, when I talk about these dimension cubes, we have, you know, we have a, a variety of dimensions, uh, product, organization, time dimensions. Those are kind of the three core ones that we build our um, dimension cubes off of. And basically, you know, we have these dimension cubes, and then we write the DAX to actually pull the data, the, these kind of the, the, the cubes themselves into these kind of these two P&L cubes. So the huge benefit of that is that at Microsoft, we have one thing, we have a lot of customized mapping. And again, Chris will show this in his cube. And basically, the premise is, is you do all your work in one cube. You get all that mapping into one cube, and then it just flows into the all the other cubes. 
Um, so if there is logic that needs to ch change, you just change it in one place, and then it just basically uh, you know, trickles down into these other cubes. So again, we found this to be uh, very easy, very very easy maintenance. Um, and again, especially like the the time dimension cube, I think that's it's a, it's a tricky cube. So um, you know, kind of leveraging like quarter to date, year to date, all those kind of um, to date attributes, having that in a single cube is, uh, is it makes our life easier. Yeah, on, on this one, I'll just add one thing. How many of you guys like doing documentation? <laughs> or how many find it good? So one of the key things that we found, and we kind of moved away a little bit from doing SQL warehouses with this, is when, you, when you're building these things into a tabular model and you can do this in Power BI, it really tends to be self-documenting. And as long as you kind of document a little bit of what you're doing, you can bring a new dev and you know, as long as they know how to open one of these cubes, they can pretty quickly figure out what the data lineage is, what the math is, what's connected to what. And so it's really a huge benefit. And then when you, the other piece is, which we'll get to, is when you're doing traditional SQL, you're having to document, and this is a stored procedure, this is a view, how are those connected together? Obviously, when, when, when you're just going straight to source, doing the transformation within tabular models, really don't run into any of those issues. So. I highly encourage you to take a look at this. Right. And one more comment, Lum. So basic, go back. So for this P&L cube that I talk about, this is a cube first um, solution. So we don't have an ETL. So the MSL or this sales cube is a lot larger in scope and just pulling it is a lot more difficult. But this P&L cube is cube first. So the huge benefit, I mean, there's a number of benefits, but the one benefit that I found is that um, you know, you don't have some of, the, the, some of the, the issues that you may have with an ETL, like with the trunk and load. Sometimes it may fail or you'll have data issues. I mean, basically, the beauty of having a tabular cube is that you just refresh the cube itself. It pulls the data. And then if you have a failure, it doesn't replace the existing data. So um, granted, the, the data may be stale, but at least it's accurate at cer a certain point in time. So we found that to be very valuable as well. All right. So, so I want to talk kind of three, um, three kind of three topics that I think, again, based on based on our learnings. Um, so the first one is just simplified measures. So to the right here or to the left, this is a cube that I looked at. It has 43 measures, each with three to three to ten different children or three three to ten children. And I've done this type of type of development in the past. I mean, everybody has done this. Um, but we found that it's just very confusing to our end user and even me as somebody that's familiar with the data. When I open up a, up a cube like this with hundreds of measures, it's just overwhelming. And I mean, we, we, we really want to kind of engage our customers. We want like our new users to have an enjoyable experience. So what we found that works well for us is just we have a single measure. Um, and you know, so instead of having, so the, these, the single measure, is driven by um, by cube dimensions instead of by by cube dimensions. So, for example, if you look at like actuals, budget forecast, those are kind of, uh, uh, some core um, uh, cycles that we look at. So, instead of having that in a measure, we actually have a dimension that will switch between those, you know, actuals, budget, forecast. Um, so, again, that really works for it well for us. Um, the other one I see the other the other point I want to make is just we have. We have very specific data. This cube is huge in size, but we have very specific data. Whereas in this cube here, you have just a, a mix of data. And this is like, you know, this is a this is a, a large cube, and um, but it has in our in, in our experience, it just has too much data, right? It has activations, it has um, telemetry te telemetry data. It's just too much data with, within a single cube. So that's where we rely upon again some of these more um, uh, focus cubes that I showed in the beginning. Um, and then the final thing that I talk about, that we want to talk a little bit about is just the, the built-in context. And that's kind of what I mentioned here. It's like we have, you know, we have, we call it, it's, it's this version display name. Is, and that's basically how we cut our data based on a dimension. So, you know, we have actuals, we have forecast, and these are all our different, kind of our different cycles. Um, so instead of, again, having all these embedded within a single measure, we just have this dim that switches in between. And then the, the final comment is just um, the um, 
kind of the, the, again context related. So for example, forecast is based on the current forecast. So there, you can't really necessarily go back to a different. Well, you can. You can look at a different. Um, you can look at a prior forecast. You won't get your VTF, but the end user can calculate that on their own. But just having a VTF that's based on the current forecast, again, that's um, that solve that that that. Uh, basically serves 90% of our customers. Um, okay. okay. What are we looking at for so time? What we're going to do is we also didn't want to just show you a PowerPoint. We wanted to show you a little bit of the, the, the back end. So yeah. to, to Jim's point, this is the value measure. It's a single value. And then the instead of having you know 12, we, we see cubes with 12 or 1,300 different measures, what we've got is you start to build the version display name. And so instead of driving a ton of measures, which really makes the maintenance of, of these things complicated. And again, this applies to SSAS or Power BI. We feel like at least when you're building sort of systems for, for finance, this construct works really, really well. And these cubes then are contextual, sorry, these dimensions. So for example, when I look at a uh, variance to forecast, it contextually knows what to compare to. And so with a single click, you can get to both. The other really big benefit of this is you know, we, we have one of these, uh, we have a few golden rules. One of those is don't automate whiteboards. <laughs> uh, but the other one is um, we really want every click from a user standpoint to be about a second. And so we've spent five years perfecting, which is not much, but really simplifying and then making it simpler to get to this point. So the next uh, topic that I want to talk about a little bit about is just having multiple cube facts. So um, when we build out this cube, we have our core fact, which has all the details. Again, this has 1.3 billion records. But then we also have a subset of our audience that focus primarily on kind of two core dimensions. They focus on product, and they focus on organization. So what we've done is we ha we've created two more uh, tables within the cube itself with much less detail. So again, one of those facts is um, product-based, product-centric, um, and then one is organization-centric. But also, to be able to pull this off, we go back to what we talked about earlier in having a, a single value measure. Because to accomplish this, I mean, it's really predicated on having that value measure. Or if you don't, it's going to get very complicated. Um, so here's kind of a screenshot from SSMS. And basically, here's the, the three um, tables that I talked about. Here's our core table, and then we have by product and by profit center. Yeah, and, and on this one, on, on the cube that we're about to show you, I think it has 1.8 billion records on the main fact. But what we found is 90% of the queries that are coming back from the users, they're either pivoting by product or by org, as, as Jim said. And so once we remove then the details, we basically have two tables that are adjacent that have 100 million rows each. And so as a query comes in, the engine is going to look at it and determine whether it needs to hit scan 1.8 billion records or only scan 100 million records. And that's partially how we keep uh, performance where we right. do. And, and we had one user that one of our queries was taking seven minutes. And I think we got that down to 30 seconds. So um, just consider that. Um, for, those, for those geeks out here, this is kind of the, the secret sauce behind that. Um, and then again, this is, and this is embedded within the value measure that we talked about. And the the, the core, the, 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 the what makes this work is this is cross, is cross filtered um, uh, function. And basically, depending upon how you filter the data, that is what will um, select one of these three tables. So again, if you have all the detail, you're going to go to the PNL data. Otherwise, if if you just have it by product, by fiscal year, by uh, for actuals, then you'll just hit this table here, and it's much smaller uh, in size. So, and uh, I'll give Marco a plug here. He has a really an awesome posting on SQL BI on on how to do this. Yeah. Marco Russo, those uh, those Marco of you are Russo, aware, yeah. yeah. He's okay. So that's the the third one, and then the second one, and the third one is just again context related time dimensions. I, for us. Um, our users complain a lot about maintenance hell, and basically, you know, rolling over to the next fiscal year, updating the reports, ro even rolling over to the next month or next quarter, it's a very painful process, and um, it's something that we try to get 
our users out of the business of kind of maintaining and basically, again, shifting all that logic into, um, into the cube itself. So again, we have this time context. Um, and again, also, it just, re again, reports, it simplifies reporting, plus also some of the Power BI that Chris has done. Um, so we have this single dimension called the time context. And again, this is, um, and this is kind of the, so the various attributes within that um, context dimension. Um, and I think the, the, really the core ones that we use are by month to date and then by quarter to date. And basically this is the category and then the individual name. So basically the way our users, our users use this or our customers use this is they just set uh, the quarter to date flag to quarter to date. And essentially as time goes on, it just, it just works, right? Um, and our users don't do anything. So if the, if the end user sets up the reports um, appropriately, they should never have to touch it. Um, even when they roll over to the next fiscal year, I mean, it just, everything just kind of, you know, once you process that cube and time passes and that cube, that, that dimension gets processed, I mean, that's all that needs to happen. So, um, again, there's, yep. Lom will give so a demo. I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you guys quickly how that works. Um, the big benefit on this is that um, it's really doing two things. One, we're, again, not creating three, four hundred measures for the cross join of those two. Um, the second benefit is the way we really achieve this, again, for those geeks out there, is we <laughs> use many to many relationships on the back end to basically then take the monthly data and send it to different versions of this. And so we'll quickly show you, we go here. So now in just a few clicks, for example, I can have a cross join of the same data. This, we did not duplicate the data. So for example, the year to date, is going to have within it the quarter to date numbers just by default, but because of the many to many relationship on the back end, we end up not duplicating any data and showing this. So really the beauty of this then ends up being if I wanted to build a really big report that shows me all the data that I need, and I did want to do that, let's say by, um, by account and be able to drill into it really, really quickly, it's pretty awesome because you can get to it in just a few clicks. Can you bring in the month? Absolutely. That would be that would highlight help. This come on, yeah. Yeah, so this is H two, right? Uh, Here. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So yeah, Q two, Q to date, so April, May. Um, yeah. Yeah. So this is a small <laughs> screenshot, but this is. Oh, sorry. <laughs> but, huh? Yeah. So this is a small screen. So, so basically, this is trying to basically show that many, many type relationship. So you have the kind of a uh, a distinct fiscal month ID, and then you have this. Uh, uh, um, uh, huh? Me? No. It's but it's, it's multi. It's bidirectional that relationship and then you join that to the fact and that's how you get and we I mean we use this um, kind of this this notion when we do act so like for our because we blend um, forecast data with the actuals data we use that same concept so again you're not duplicating data um, you're just you know, kind of mashing it together to, to, to get what you need okay um, so I don't have a lot of time here, but basically the last thing I want to highlight, which is a passion of mine, is PowerShell. And basically the greatness of PowerShell. And what I love about PowerShell is, so w when I go, when we talk about, um, well, one of, our, one of our goals is to have 15-minute 50, 50 refreshes, which is unheard of within the company itself. And the way that we achieve that is we only refresh data that is, um, you know, that, that needs to be refreshed. So normally we would refresh like the whole fiscal year, but we did some analysis and we only and only two months of data change. So to accomplish that, we had to actually partition our data. Um, so we per partitioned that data by month. So in th this case, this is budget data. Um, but basically, we, but if we had like actuals or yeah, actuals data, um, again, it would be partitioned by month, but then we would only refresh two partitions. Um, but the great thing about PowerShell is that basically once you have this base query here, in this case, 
um, just this base query, um, we actually use PowerShell to create all these partitions. So um, it's just, it just makes things so much easier to maintain. And on this one, we have a cube that has 1,100 partitions. So because we do it by week over five years or so. Right. And so if you need to go update that, it would be a lot of work to click 1,100 times. And it's magic. You just basically you know, press a button, use PowerShell, and it does this for you. Exactly, yeah. So I, I highly recommend learning PowerShell or at least becoming familiar with PowerShell from the standpoint of refreshing these or creating these partitions and actually refreshing the partitions as well. Um, because you can build in all that custom logic to, to know what to, to. And then I, I think we're at time, but basically this, this is just uh, the back end of the partitions. And yeah. then what uh, Chris is going to do here in 10 minutes, um, he's going to show really then how we leverage Power BI connected to this infrastructure to deliver an awesome user experience. Yeah. All right. Thank you for your time.